Okay, welcome to Gear or Gadget, a piece of content designed and geared around helping you make gear, hunting gear purchases. Uh, today we have Josh Talker on the show from Hunting Beast, Hunting Beast Gear. Yep. And before we get started, we got to break down the rules. I'm sure you've watched the show. Yeah, I've watched, I think I've watched all of them in preparation, so. Very good, very <laughs> good. Uh, rule number one, you cannot use the word or term game changer. If that comes out of your mouth, you are exiled, and somewhere around here I have a knife. <laughs> Cut the tongue out. And we're going to turn all your cell cams off. And we will turn all your cell cams off. Yeah, that's your problem. Uh, that's motivation. Right? Rule number two, no brand bashing. We're just here to give our opinions on the gear we purchased, on specific pieces of gear. Try to leave the brands out of it. For sure. Try to, stay, it. try to stay professional here. And rule number three, if you guys like and find value in this content, be sure to subscribe to the channel, give us a thumbs up, and leave us a comment on uh, what we're talking about here. So let's start this off. I brought to Gear or Gadget today, quite possibly the best cold weather whitetail garment available to hunters. And I know what you're gonna say, it's expensive. This is the Sitka Fanatic bib. And yes, it is expensive, but this is, in my opinion, the best cold weather garment available to whitetail hunters, tree stand hunters. Anything along that line, if you hunt in cold weather, maybe you're up north. I know the southern guys, this isn't really going to be anything that you can wear because it is warm. You can't walk in it. You have to pack this thing in. But if you're in the late season, everyone knows late season is one of the best opportunities to kill a mature buck. And if you still have a tag in your pocket and aren't wearing the Sitka Fanatic bibs, you're missing out. Give some context around cold. Because some people think that yeah. 40 is cold. Some think that no, 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 minus no. 10 is cold. If you wore this in 40 degrees, you'd only be in your underwear. I'm talking like 20s and below to like negative temps. Like if you have the right base layer underneath this, you can wear, you can hunt in negative degree temperature. Um, they're like the, it's super quiet. Everything the way this is designed is for a whitetail hunter. There's a built-in hand muff. The jacket has like the grunt tube pockets and rangefinder pockets. And yeah, I hunted last year in some really bad snow. Snow just sticks to this and it doesn't melt. And the only thing that I can think of is it's keeping all of your warmth inside of it and not letting it out. And the exterior of this is still cold enough for snow to stick to. So yeah, Chad, you have experience with Fanatic uh gear as well to you at all yeah i have some of the sickest stuff i don't think i have those bibs yet um but it's funny you brought those in because i was just looking at something to upgrade this year for late late season man i'm telling you like this is it this is i think this is the newer set that's like the 2.0 yeah, or the like the second guys. version um and i think there's some differences in like the fleece or the berber material and how far it comes down yeah so the, mm -hmm. the i think the original piece had that least going all the way down to the legs which attracts burrs snags and, and then they went to like a soft shell on that lower we'll call it like the lower third or lower yeah. half still of like, those yeah silent. but it's still quiet yeah still quiet Sika does a great job with like the engineering the specifics and the yeah. minute details that a lot of other companies overlook pocket placement um the coatings on the zippers how quiet they are it's i mean they do a great job there's no i mean there's no question about it yeah for sure everything's always so thought out with their gear like um like for example i love the idea of having a hand muff um yes. built in because just another piece of gear you kind of eliminate out of your your arsenal i'm a big fan of that um it only yeah. really works if you wear it on the outside if you have that jacket over top of it you don't have the but, access to this but the muffs put into the jacket, yeah, the jacket too. has yeah. muffs too yeah yeah yeah, yeah. so yeah i'm t i'm man I, I love this yeah i hunt from the ground a lot and i'll get myself tucked up into some snow it's i don't feel the snow yeah and like the way the color pattern is there's white in it i blend right in i yeah, I, I freaking love this thing. i had a pair of like the cabelas i can't remember yeah, what they're even called 
Yeah, but man, we have a lot of those cockaburs in our like our yeah, like yeah. cornfield edges and yeah. stuff, and it's just a nightmare. Yeah. Like a nightmare wearing those things. Um, yeah, you almost dread it just walking to the stand because you know you're going to be covered in in those cockaburs and, and stuff. So yeah, you um, can't. I like wear... the idea of. I mean, this stuff. Their their stuff still can stick to this, but not like yeah. some of the other material. But you um, can't wear these in. Very rarely do I. Mean, I. Yeah. You can, but you're like. If I'm walking, like some of the private stuff that uh, I had a late season last year where you're walking like 150 yeah. yards, 200 yards, I'll wear those and leave everything open and yeah, unzipped. They, they have zippers down the side, so you can kind of. Yeah, full length up. zippers um, up the legs and then also on the torso. Yep. So you can wear the suspenders, unzip everything. And I have walked in like that, but you still have to go relatively slow i mean that's not something you want to zip completely up throw the jacket on and walk because you're gonna overheat you will sweat yeah you're and that's when you get cold yeah so yeah for me um if you're in the market for something to get you out in the woods when those temperatures are frigid maybe you're up north and your temperatures are cold all the time check out the sitka fanatic bibs for me it's a piece of gear i know it's expensive but it's expensive for a reason. You get what you pay for when it comes to garments, hunting garments. And I will always have these in my arsenal for mm -hmm. late season. Yeah, I think Sika has, a, if I'm not wrong, a lifetime warranty on stuff too, don't they? They'll repair stuff. I'm not that's sure. What, what, that's what I'm I meant. Sure. Yeah, I think that you can get them repaired stuff. Whereas you can buy just some knockoff brand from wherever. I'm, you rip them, they're done or whatever. Right. The zipper breaks on them. Or, so that's all can be factored into the cost of things. Yeah. What'd you bring? So, I got something kind of unique, I think. Um, they're a pair of hip waders, and I've had these this pair probably for 10 years now, and they're um, a, a Dan's frog leg is what they're called, and they're made for like the dog hunting world, like coon hunters and, and squirrel hunters. Um, and essentially what they are is they're a pair of waders, but they're actually briar proof. So they're, they're, they're waterproof all the way up um, to your hip. Um, but, Typically in these, you know, types of, of uh, rubber boots, the neoprene top is kind of what wears out on you or you get snagged or whatever and they start leaking there. But with these, um, you know, these, these briar proof um, leg here covers all that up. So um, essentially you have a completely briar proof, completely waterproof uh, set of hip waders that'll last forever. And then if these do start to leak eventually, um, you can actually just take these off and then you have a, a pair of boots that you can wear for another year or so. I, I wear these all the time. Uh, specifically scouting um, if we're you know, in, a, in a marshy area. And in southern Indiana, where I live, we have a lot of briar patches and, and green brush and whatnot. So, yeah, I think it's a it's a product that I use all the time, and I probably don't give it enough praise as, as it deserves. They're not quiet by any means or anything. Um, it's not something you probably want to wear in the stand, but it's um, it's a piece of, of gear that I, uh, I've used for years now, um, put a lot of miles on them, and they're still in pretty good shape. And you can also... Like the, the company that makes these, Dan's, they have like probably a list of 15 different boots you can put on the bottom of them. So if you have like your favorite rubber boot you like, um, they can put about anything on, um, on the bottom of them for you. How do they attach? Um, so you really can't take them off per se. You have to cut them off. But I believe underneath here, they have some type of a sealant that goes around um, the, the top of the boot. But like I said, I've had those to pair for 10 years and they're just now starting to leak through. Um, so and, when you... Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No, it's, it, and it's just a slow leak. It's not like I, my feet get real wet in them or anything, but I wouldn't stand in water for a long time in, nowadays. But, yeah. So when you purchase these set of waders, mm -hmm. you're purchasing them from the company with a specific boot? Yep. So, like, so they're putting it together for you? Exactly. Okay. You, you pick out what boot you want. Um, you know, they have a little drop-down box on when you order them, and it tells you. And they got everything from lacrosse to muck to, I don't know, they got about everything you, you'd want on there. Um, yeah, it's been a, a cool piece of gear for me that, you know, it's not really marketed to deer hunters per se, but um, I use them a lot. So when you're going to purchase these, if you were to kind of itemize the cost because you're buying the boot and the waiter, yeah. waiter, like what would like what's the price difference? So, or what's what's yeah, what's you can you can make them as cheap as possible. Like they have a a pair, and don't quote me on on this, but like there's a there's a, a set of boots that are like eighty bucks you can put on them, and they got the high end, you know, like the expensive muck boots that are almost $200 you can put on them. So the cost really depends on, you know, what you want. Um, but you can safely get into those for like 120 bucks probably. So the yeah. additional cost of this piece is like 40 bucks. Not much. Yeah. yeah. I can't, I can't remember what the, the top is, but, um, yeah, the most of the cost is you're, you're buying the, 
the boot from them. Right. Um, and like I said, like if I if I would lift this up, um, you know, the, the neoprene top is going to look brand new. I mean, there's nothing that can um, really get to it um, per se. Like that would typically ruin your neoprene tops. And they also can put them on those uh, like Burley Classics, those old yeah yeah stuff like that. That's yeah. like the full rubber boots. Yeah. So, These are pretty sweet. I um, they're light too. Like they don't weigh yeah. much more than the boot does, which um, you know I wouldn't. I don't like like regular neoprene waders. Like I wouldn't wear those through the brush and everything. Right. They're gonna ruin pretty quick. With these, you can just put them on the truck and get going. Especially scouting when you're not worried about making noise or anything. Yeah, that's where I see them coming into yeah. play a lot. Is yeah. scouting. I I'm not a rubber boot guy. I hate rubber boots. I went on record and said that there's absolutely zero use for them. <laughs> I just, I don't like, they're not comfortable, but, um, and another reason I hate them is because they always start to leak. Yeah. And this kind of helps eliminate that. Cause like you said, the neoprene part of it's what goes bad. And yeah. like this part is always fine. So this kind of preserves them for like you, you said, you've had these for 10 years. Oh yeah. How many times have you worn a pair of rubber boots for 10 years? Never. Never. Yeah. Yeah. And it's not like, you know, they're not my everyday boots i don't wear them every day um but it's something you could you could pick up and, and have for for a long time like this example like this is a, a, a used example obviously but these are a little bit stiff when you first get them like the tops are a little bit stiff but after a day of walking in it, it uh it wears in and everything's nice and easy to use again what kind of material is that because that's like a is it a canvas or like a duck material i mean it's something that's I, I'm not, yeah, I'm not real sure what the actual material is, but I mean, I guess if, you, like could, if, nylon, you, if you could think of it, like it's like a pair of brush pants is what it yeah. is, what it feels like. Yeah. Um, but yeah. The, and they're way lighter than actually wearing a pair of brush pants. Too. Well, yeah, I don't think, well, it's just the brush part. It's not, yeah. uh, you know, there's not any material underneath it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, and there's a couple other companies that make something similar, um, but Dan's is the one I've always bought. Um, I've only had two pairs of them because they last so long, but yeah. Um, yeah, that's my my piece of gear for sure. Yeah, I'd, I'd say it's a piece of gear too. I like it. I mm -hmm. think it um, it might me might make me buy another pair of rubber boots and <laughs> get a pair of these. I could see uh, I could see where they can come in handy for sure. Yeah, definitely, definitely a piece of gear. You know, the one thing like as you brought this in and are talking about it, I'm thinking about different scenarios. Well, we don't hunt swamps a ton, but we do have some swamp, lowland, marshy mm -hmm. areas in you know in and around this area and. We have spent some time scouting both in season and post season. And one of the things that gets so frustrating is like, I refuse, we walk too much to wear chest waders. Yeah, yeah, like you just sure. can't wear chest waders around all the time. Yeah. And I get frustrated because I, you have rubber boots and you're walking through the, the bogs and the swamp. And inevitably, if the ground is not frozen, you're going to be down over top of your boots. Like it, it happens. Yeah. Um, and I, like I could see myself, having these and i wouldn't use them a ton but yeah right to have them for those specific scenarios i i could see myself purchasing that in the future opening day 2019 we might have got to where we wanted to get to if we hadn't <laughs> yeah yeah we were trying to get to that island and we could we just couldn't get there because it was too the water was too high yeah i mean we were walking through stuff that was past our knees yeah thigh high yeah, yeah. We we're like oh we're gonna get soaked and yeah that would have that would show you like something else, like for like you can wear them like this too, where you can like unfold them, like if you don't want them all up, because because obviously this isn't breathable, it's waterproof. Um, so a lot of times I'll, I'll you'll throw them on like this, and just whenever you get to where you're going, pull yeah. them up over your um, over your hip there, and then go across creek or whatever you want to. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they're much lighter than um, you know a pair of typical pair of hip waders. So I have I I don't know why anybody would not buy these versus uh, a pair of hip waders for what for what we do. Uh, walking around in the woods and like you know duck hunting and stuff that's a different story but um yep yeah i like it very cool so what i have <laughs> brought to the table is kind of i'm gonna say brand selfish okay <laughs> um we've been in 10 some episodes probably 10 plus 10 there. plus episodes yeah. maybe 10 ish we'll say 10 ish episodes and we've yet to talk about trail cameras and what i have is you can put this on record Coin my words, it is the biggest technological advancement for the modern day deer hunter since modern firearms. And that is cell cameras. That's bold. Cellular trail cameras. That's bold? It's bold. I don't think it's bold at all. I like it. I like that you're going that route, but that's, that's a bold statement. 
So listen, it, um, you know, a lot of people think they look at cell cameras and they see the, I guess, the advancement on the technology side. And they think that it's, you know, it's cool to get your picture sent to your phone. It's cool not to be intrusive, but it, like in my mind, from a guy running a business, a guy that has a family, two young kids, the amount of time that these things have saved me over the last couple of years versus going out and running and managing regular SD card cameras is absolutely insane. Um, you know, our product is relatively on the higher end. When you look at the scale of, you know, commodity cameras, commodity cell cameras, higher end cameras, we're up near Spartan. We're a little bit cheaper than Spartan. So we're not quite there at the, at the most expensive side because of the business model. But I'd be willing to pay 500 plus dollars for these. I mean, again, I, you, you kind of see that and get shick, uh, sticker shock up front. But knowing the amount of time that it saves me over the course of a year, time, gas, I mean, there's a big added value to running cell cameras that pe a lot of people don't think about. Yeah, I think we had one guy even say to us that was buying it. He's like, you're selling me time. Yeah, exactly. It's what you're selling me is time. Yeah, exactly. And and I think as people, we've just now hit kind of critical mass with these things like social so, social acceptance. More and more people are getting into them. There's still a learning curve, which we've been trying to combat that with a lot of the educational stuff that we're putting out. But when you're using these, you know, not only in season, but when you're using them in conjunction with like previous uh, trail camera data from the previous year. So we talk a lot about the historical uh, data value, like running longer term sets, getting good data points from not, you know, constantly going in and checking your cameras. Um, and when you have those windows of daylight activity based on historical data, that's when these things become like ultra, ultra, ultra deadly. Mm -hmm. Go put those in the spots. You get that first, um, that first photo and then you know, okay, I got, he's here for this window. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah I, I think, um, there's so many, so many advantages to running a cell camera. Time is one of them. And then learning about, you can, I, I can analyze the data quicker, obviously because yes. it's coming to my phone and I can then say, okay, the wind direction is this right now. Mm -hmm. The temperature is this right now. The pressure is this right now. Like I can take that photo and analyze what's happening right now. It, whereas if you're running a standard SD card camera and you pull that card two weeks ago, you can get yourself just like you're scrolling through the pictures. It's like, oh, they daylighted this day. And then you don't go back and see why. It's all about the why when it comes to deer. And you have the ability to analyze that why, that why right now as soon as you get the data. Even if it's on a 24-hour upload and you get it the next day, you can still look at yesterday's weather and say, okay, this is what we had compared to letting the camera soak for two weeks, going in and checking it, and you're behind the eight ball. It's too late. Yeah. And the other thing, um, kind of building off of that point is running a, and we run a lot of them, obviously, um, running these things and actually seeing in specific scenarios or specific sets, like how much deer actually move in the day. Yeah. If you have them in the right spots, like people talk about nocturnal deer all the time and like, mm -hmm. they're not, if you have the cameras in the right spot, you'll see like the slightest change in weather or something happens and deer up on their feet and you're like whoa i didn't think you were going to move today and then you go back and look like i said at the weather data and you're like oh there was a wind change it's still 80 degrees but the wind went from north to south right and they're switching beds i caught them on that travel pattern and you can really get an idea of how much your deer are actually moving i think it's that and i also think people um have the intention of buying these things and putting them more in more intrusive areas. Yeah. So they're getting back into the cover, maybe a staging area, maybe they're on the edge of bedding. And I think that, you know, not being afraid to put them in more intrusive areas also is leading, you know, us to getting that information too. Yeah. And I think that's a good point. And I, I probably run 12 cell cameras and like to, to me, it's not all that stuff you guys are talking about. It's great. But like, you hear Dan Infall and all these guys talk about the importance of the, of the first sit and, and the first time you go in there being, you know, when you set up and kill the, the big deer. And I think most people aren't disciplined enough to, to out. throw out an SD card camera and, and, you know, and not go in there. But, and, and you got to think of it like that. Like it's not, 
just because you're not hunting doesn't mean that that pressure, those deer don't know the difference. That buck walks by where you walk to go get that SD card, and all of a sudden to him, you were, you were there at just as well as you were hunting there. Um, that's where it's helped me a, a bunch is because because I'm as, as guilty as anybody about going and checking cameras more than, than you should um, just because you want that intel. And then that's that's where I almost don't run an SD card camera anymore and, and try to, if I, you know, if I can in the area, run something that, that'll send me a picture um, on my phone. And then, you know, if, if you don't like the the fact that, um, you know, it's giving you instant data, you know, some people have a problem with that where, um, you know, you don't have to get it sent to you every every picture set it on once a week or every day or whatever the case may be. Um, if that's a, a, something that you don't, don't feel comfortable with. So, um, yeah, they're invaluable for, um, you know, getting Intel in a, a manner that is not intrusive. Yeah. You know, the, the, the ethics or morality side of these things mm -hmm. is something that people often talk about. And to me, it's like, this is a machine. It's a device that has no cognitive ability. Like it doesn't know what it's doing. It's just doing a specific thing. So, you know, if you're on the fence about the ethics or morality of what this could lead you to, like it, it lies within the person. Yeah, like, for sure. Because you can hang this on a bed and hang multiple, like on exits and mm -hmm. no deer's here, deer's there, deer, and make real time decisions on it. Or you could do it exactly, use yeah. it in a manner exactly what you said, put it into a place, have photos uploaded, you know, once a day, mm -hmm. just based on, hey, I don't want to go into this area. So mm -hmm. there's, um, a lot of pros to it. Yeah. Sure. Um, from your eyes, do you, do you see any backside, any downside from cellular cameras over uh, standard? Yeah. Cameras? Yeah. Absolutely. I think there's um, I think there's some cons. Obviously, the the there's a more upfront cost to them. Um, no, I think that again, going through the time thing, I think that you get that money back over time. Um, there is, I think, the biggest con right now is the fact that they are still relatively new. And there is a steep learning curve um, when, when folks are using these things on the consumer side. On the company side, um, they are relatively complex when you start comparing them to regular SD card cameras. There's, you know, if something does go haywire, that troubleshooting process Ooh. between a cell camera and SD card camera is magnified by 10 times. Oh, easily. You yeah. have, you know, um, it could be network issues from your carrier. It could be server issues. It could be an app issue. It could be a camera issue. It could be a user issue. Yeah. Those phone calls go from three minute phone calls to 30 minute phone calls. Very quickly. Yeah. yeah. So I think, um, you know, as people become more f familiar with them, um, and again, I think that we've only kind of hit critical mass over the last 18 months, probably maybe two years. Um, as people become more familiar with them, I think it will become easier on, on folks um, as they become more educated on, on the product. And one, one other thing to note that may, it's not necessarily a con, but it's something to like really be aware of is the power consumption. Yeah. These are powerful tools and they are using battery batteries a lot quicker than a standard SD card camera. And the, the reason that you're running a cell camera is so you don't have to go back to it. And when you have to change your batteries more often, it's kind of like, oh, do I need one? Use an external power source. Yeah. And it's like... Your, that worry is over. Uh, the SB18 that is compatible with that that we sell, I've had cameras on trees for a year and a half plus that I've never gone back to and changed batteries. Yeah. So. Yeah, that's a, that's a must. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I, I think I don't. I've I've talked about it on a podcast before. I don't want to run standard SD card cameras anymore. I don't. I love those. I love cell cameras. For me, I'm always going to run them, and I will continue to add to the arsenal. And it also makes running standard SD card cameras in long-term sets easier because then I can go set a camera with a uh, standard SD card camera with long-term objectives, forget about it and say, okay, I'm going to get this data from this year, analyze that data for the year. Next year, I know where I need to put a cell camera. I can go in and say, okay, I have that data. This buck showed up October 14th. October 10th, I need to have a cell camera in there ready for him to show up when he does show up. I know what he's going to do next. Yeah. So it's, yeah, it's that. And I think um, like to, to Josh's point about like being disciplined of not going in and checking cameras constantly, like this kind of suffices that I'm getting that dopamine hit. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> kind of you get your morning, you get your fix. Kinda. Yeah. Yeah. It's gear for me. Yep. Piece of gear all the way. <laughs>